ICW's director of policy and advocacy, and also these days the project director for this um, project, which we are hearing from the final round of publications from tonight, The Economic Costs of Child Marriage. Um, this is a project that some of you may have joined us last summer for the big launch of our global synthesis, synthesis report, which is available on the publications table and on our website. That was the big first flush of what we managed to do in three years of collaboration with the World Bank, with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. And that was where we looked at what are the impacts of child marriage? How can we cost those? How do we tally up those numbers and arrive at a figure that we will be startling enough to policymakers to impel them into action to invest in ending this practice at the scale that it is taking place, which is 650 million women alive today who are married as girls, roughly 12 million girls a year. Um, that is something we've done a lot of at ICRW over the years found that costing so-called women's issues, women-raised violence, maternal health, now child marriage, can be an effective tool in harnessing policymaker attention and investment. Um, and working with the World Bank is a great way to do that um, because as we work with so many of you, the bank works with so many governments who are able to take those findings, which again, we are not talking about tonight. They're on the table at the back if you want them. You're able to take those to governments, governments who have high burden of the, uh, the practice, as well as donor governments, our own here in the US, uh, the UK, Canada, donors who are already investing in this practice, but want to be able to take that back to their taxpayers and say, here's why. It really is costing the economy trillions. So that was phase one. Phase two was talking about that, sharing that with governments. Um, we also are a co-chair here at ICRW of Girls Not Brides USA. Are you familiar with Girls Not Brides? Global partnership on um, ending child marriage with members in countries all over the world um, who are taking advocacy messages to their governments, who are implementing projects, um, who are doing research with the goal of ending child marriage. So we've been taking that that initial costing work to them, helping arm and equip them to utilize those numbers in their advocacy messages, presenting at coral summits at the African Union. You get the picture. This is the third and final round of that project, and you're hearing tonight a little sneak preview at our Insights to Action, which is a series of events that ICRW uses to tell you the latest insights we're learning, um, get your feedback, get your questions, Tonight, you will hear from us about where we have dug in on specific cutting edge issues that we felt hadn't been sufficiently explored in the literature and where ICRW really wanted to dig in on human costs. Because at the end of the day, yes, we care about the dollars and cents. We also care about girls. And we're a feminist organization. We want to be able to look at the data and see not just dollar signs, but also be able to talk about what is the impact of this practice on the life of a girl, what does that mean at scale? What are the connections to mental health, food insecurity, reproductive coercion? These are things that we don't see in the literature, and this is what we're trying to address with this final round of research, which is ICRW specifically digging in on those issues. So in the course of tonight's conversation, you will get the preview, the briefs, um, which are also available at the back and on our website, um, on each of those specific issues. You'll hear presentations by the researchers in succession on what they found. We'll do a panel discussion and be joined by a friend who is not an ICRW researcher and interrogate some of that further. We'll do Q&A with you all and hear from you about your experience, how this jives, how you might use this in your work. Um, and then Shima, our Director of Global Health, Youth, and Development, will wrap us up. So, Assuming that's the flight you thought you were boarding this evening, <laughs> we're going to get rolling. Um, welcome to those of you who are in the room. I hope you've had an opportunity to get a snack or a beverage. Um, please help yourself throughout the evening. We also have folks who are joining us on live via the web stream. So thanks to those of you who are with us. And for those of you who tweet, we are tweeting. Um, you can see the handles of those of us who are on Twitter under our um, 
but as, as well as the hashtags ICRW Insight and, and Child Marriage. So, without further ado, let's get started. We're going to move now into the presentations themselves. And first, I would like to welcome um, Aslan Kess, who is ICRW Senior Economist and really led a lot of the thinking throughout this project as we were designing conceptual models, doing the boxing work, and her background is in agriculture and food security. So, no surprise, she's going to be presenting to us some of the work that she's done exploring the connection between those two issues. Welcome, Asla. Thank you very for the introductions and walking us through a three long years of the work that we've done uh, with many many colleagues that I serve with you. Some of them are here today, it's great, and it's event, as you mentioned. And uh, as we wrap up this uh, global program of research, here we go. Uh, I want to first step up the bag and, and take us to the inception phase of this research where we were able to really, as you, as you mentioned, uh, as well, to really look at what is it out there in the literature, what are some of the domains of impact in which we already have existing evidence, and how can we organize them, and, and systematically look at the existing evidence in a way to then be able to uh, interrogate and investigate potential pathways to economic costs. Uh, so as you can see, what was uh, emerged from that initial uh, review of evidence uh, was that there were five key domains of impact that we if we saw significant sort of concentration of, of learning. Yes. Fertility and population growth, health, nutrition and violence, educational attainment and learning, labor force participation and the type of work, and lastly, participation decision making and investments, including investment decisions. So what, what was new and innovative about this and in terms of also really bridging, uh, uh, not bridging, but really thinking about how we can improve upon advocacy, evidence-based advocacy with non-traditional partners was to really understand and, and identify and measure costs. And at first we talked about, I thought about uh, economic costs as, as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and those were economic productivity and uh, earnings productivity, consumption per capita, public and expenditures due to uh, child marriage and its consequences. But what also emerged very clearly to us from the very early point is that we also wanted to look at and not ignore the non-monetary and social costs of child marriage incurred by not only girls themselves, but their households, their communities, and uh, the economy and, and sort of the greater community at large. And today uh, uh, we are focusing on those some of those human costs, as, as Derek said, and, and uh, specifically in my case, food security, and this is really helped by the case study field work we did in the three countries of focus as part of phase two of this research, which were Niger, Ethiopia, and, and Nepal. And just to touch on quickly on the methodology, in these three countries, we uh, fielded our own quantitative survey, which were representative of the women, the female population in the countries, uh, collected data from around three to 4,000 uh, women and their households, but uh, in the two countries, or Ethiopia and, and Niger. And in all three countries, we also did qualitative uh, interviews, uh, in depth interviews with women who were married at an early age, and also focused with discussions with men and women to understand some of the uh, underlying uh, norms and attitudes toward child marriage, and, and to also to understand what outcomes are, are experienced by or noticed by communities. Uh, so with that very quick overview, I now want to sort of go back to the primary focus of my research, which was our research, which was on, on food security, which I actually did with Mara Steinhaus from I certainly as well, who is not here right now, but, but she and I worked on this particular piece of research. Uh, uh, and focusing on, especially in Niger, where not only child marriage is the highest among well, in, uh, among globally across across countries, but food security is, is a significant and chronic issue that is affecting <coughs> large segments of the population. It's one of the poorest countries. A large portion of the population lives in economic vulnerability and vulnerability to shocks. And uh, according to the latest numbers in 2017, for example, 1.5 million people were affected by food insecurity, an additional 1.5 million 
uh, are estimated to be chronically food insecure. And to date, a lot of the research done in this area focused on how food insecurity and water economic insecurity could be a driver of child marriage, child marriage. marriage. Uh, in this research, what we wanted to explore more closely was the reverse relationship, whether or not child marriage impacted households food insecurity uh, as women uh, sort of enter into marriage at an early age and as a result of that may add some you know, disadvantages that they experience throughout their lives. And some of the conceptual links we found looking at the literature around food security, especially, uh, and also some around women economic environment, is that uh, women who marry early are cut their educational, uh, sort of educational advancement short. Uh, they have less agency, higher levels of fertility, all of which then are also linked to uh, food insecurity in different ways. So. Women's decision making ability is highly correlated with what is what resources they have access to and control in their households and their agricultural productivity, but also decisions around consumption uh, on food and health and other other fact, other sort of key areas which have direct <coughs> impact on household insecurity, households food insecurity or food security. Similarly, uh, in the context where high fertility and high dependency ratios are highly notable. We also know that women's care burden and just the fact that uh, there's a high dependency ratio in households also have negative impacts on uh, household uh, security. And coming back to education again, we, it's, it's women's education attainment is one of the most significant predictors of households food security in, in the in the household in different contexts, including in Asia. So with this sort of evidence uh, pointing us to a potential correlation, we 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 did uh, some analysis using two different measures of food uh, security. One uh, food uh, dietary diversity. So uh, looking at in the last seven days, the, the, the range or the number of different food categories that the households consumed. And uh, secondly, to subject to food uh, security, which was measured by a question to the woman who was early and now is an adult woman in that part of the household, whether or not they felt their household was food insecure in the last seven days prior to the, to the uh, survey. And uh, what we found was, in fact, uh, as expected, a significant association between early marriage and uh, current uh, household food insecurity. Uh, and this, this association was significant, particularly in cases where women had married in a particular at early age. So as you can see, uh, in, and this is results from the first analysis where we look at dietary diversity uh, in households where women uh, married in early age at 12. There is a significant, uh, significantly low level of dietary diversity compared <coughs> to the household where women have married not in the, or 18 and above. Uh, similarly, this uh, culminates into a significant impact at ages uh, 15 and below. So again, indicating that. Child marriage is uh, important, but that the significance is statistically significant. Sorry, uh, uh, at ages when where women have married, uh, particularly at young ages. And we found similar results also with subjective food insecurity, where uh, the earlier the woman uh, had that means married, the higher their likelihood was to report subjective food insecurity in their household today. Uh, and another uh, thing to note in our results was the, again, very significant association we found between women's education, formal education in <coughs> particular, and uh, household uh, food security me in, you know, measured in both uh, indicators. Uh, and since we did not model this, but since it's very well established that child marriage is impacting education, there's an indirect impact that is also uh, worth noting that not only child marriage directly impacts household food insecurity, but also potentially to its impact on, on women's education. 
And with that, I will stop and we'll have some time to do some more Thank you, Oslo. Um, so I find that fascinating, and we'll get more into it in the panel discussion, but basically very clear cut findings there, both measures, dietary diversity, as well as subjective reporting. Yes, I feel food insecure. We did see a relationship. So thank you for that. Um, next, we'll hear from Ted Rizzo, who is a program associate with our Global Health Youth and Development team. And he's going to be talking to us about the manifestations of reproductive coercion um, among married girls in two districts of the fall. So take a look, Ted. Good evening, all, and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so, yeah, reproductive coercion in Nepal. So, start out, I'm going to define the term reproductive coercion, which might be new for some people in this room. Um, and reproductive coercion refers to the sort of behaviors that reduce a woman's control over her reproductive decision making. And it can include behaviors such as pressure from her spouse or her spouse's family to have children or from her own family. Um, to um, sabotaging, destroying, or removing contraception, to marital rape, and to intimate partner violence with the purpose of forcing a woman's decision to have a child when she doesn't want to. And we came to this not by originally asking about it in our qualitative interview guys. And they, that I'm going to discuss today comes entirely from our qualitative research in Nepal. Um, it was not a focus of these guides necessarily. What it was was a theme that kept emerging as women were talking about their relationships with their husbands, their relationships with their family, the process of giving birth to their children. Um, and so we thought it was a theme that merited further uh, exploration, especially as we found that the relationship between child marriage, or sorry, the experience of reproductive coercion by women who married children had not really been explored as widely in the literature. There's some minimal discussions of it. So we thought it was an interesting field to take some first steps into. And so what I shared today are some of our first observations of the experience of reproductive coercion among women and married children. Um, our study districts in Nepal um, were Beitari and Rauta down there in the south. Um, Nepal's an interesting site for this study because it has the third highest rate of child marriage in South Asia, but it also has very different experiences of child marriage between the different districts. So this region up in the north, Beitari, which borders um, India in a more mountainous region, is called a hilt region. The religion is primarily Buddhist. Um, there's not so much ethnic and linguistic diversity within the area. This other state, Rabahat, uh, which borders the Indian state of Bihar, um, shows much more linguistic and ethnic and religious diversity. Um, it has a different practice around dowry in that there is much more dowry um, as a practice. Generally, things like cash, vehicles, household goods, sometimes but rarely land, whereas in the other district, we don't see it as much as a practice. So there's a number of cultural and other differences between these two districts that allow us to see reproductive coercion as it's shaped differently in the two districts. And that was one of the really stunning things about the, this district, this research, was how different women describe their experience in the two districts. And so I want to talk a little bit first about the experience in Beitari, because it was a little bit more um, dramatic. Of the, um, of the 16 women, sorry, of the 17 women who were interviewed in Beitari, 16 described some kind of experience of reproductive coercion. Now, obviously, this is not a quantitative statistic. We can't say that this is a widespread phenomenon necessarily. But what we can say is that among these women, we saw much more reproductive coercion in Nepal, or sorry, in uh, Red Hat. Um, and we saw interesting forms of the way that their reproductive decision making was limited. They experienced uh, or reported much more um, intimate partner violence. They also reported this limitation, a limitation on their mobility that happened as soon as they were married. And I think this quote is worth reading in full. In our community, daughters-in-law aren't allowed to go outside till they give birth to one or two children. We had to stay inside our house the entire time. We cannot speak to anyone. We cannot say about the food we want to eat. 
and we could and we just stay alone inside our room. We have to cook food, clean utensils, clean our house, and take care of in-laws. Almost every woman in this district discussed these limitations on mobility. Not all of them tied it quite as clearly to their to the delays in reproductive until they had produced more children. But several did. Several cited around two to three children as necessary before they started to be able to be more mobile in their districts. And what we see, of course, then is women who are not able to participate in the labor force, women whose education was often cut off earlier. Many of the women who were interviewed in Rautahat had not gone to school or had cut off their education far earlier than the girls in Beitari, um, or the women in Beitari, I should say. And we see this limitation on mobility, which is not something that's been talked about in the research as a sign of reproductive coercion, but I think is now something that is important to look for, with, at least within certain cultural contexts, as a possible marker of reproductive coercion. The other thing that we, talked, we saw a lot, and this was in both districts, was that the pressure of reproductive coercion did not always come from the spouse. It very often came from the marital family, particularly um, mothers-in-law, and to a lesser extent, sisters-in-law. Um, this is something that has started to be discussed in the literature, particularly around other areas of South Asia. Um, but it's something that we think needs to be just explored more fully, especially as we see in situations like this one here, where the mother-in-law has changed the husband's opinion. At first, he was supportive of the <coughs> woman's decision to use family planning. Over time, with pressure from his family, he became less supportive. And among other quotes, we saw this could even lead to intimate partner violence. And here we see this threat of divorce should she not start to produce children, in particular sons. There is a widespread son preference among in both the regions. So what does this mean moving forward? It means we need to look at, at research, looking at districts within different parts of the world as we explore reproductive coercion, child marriage, really breaking down below just national levels, but trying to understand sub-district levels. Um, I'm going to be the very stereotypical researcher who recommends first that we need more research. <laughs> um, but it also means we need to think about different forms of reproductive coercion, especially including limitations on women's mobility as possible ways that women are experiencing pressure to have children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. Have a seat. I think that's fascinating the way it came through that this was something that was a restriction on mobility immediately. And then, then it was, you know, two to three children's sons, ideally. And of course, at that point, you can't really be mobile because you've got all this perfecting for them. Anyway, um, thank you, Ted. We'll come back to that more in the QA. And then uh, finally, I would like to welcome me to John to the floor, who's a social and health scientist here and is going to present on um, the impact of child marriage on mental health. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is research that I did in collaboration with some of my colleagues. Uh, Jeff and me is in the room, and there's Lydia Buruki, who is not here anymore. So, uh, as you, uh, so researchers and programmers have long hypothesized that child marriage may result in poor and poor outcomes. And because of its linkages with poor decision making, agency, many of the things that have been laid out in Arthur's presentation and Ted's presentation, but there's very little uh, empirical evidence that's actually looked at this association, especially in non Western contexts. To fill this evidence gap, we included measures of overall mental health in our surveys in Niger as well as in Ethiopia. Specifically, we included a measure called the Psychological General Wellbeing Index which is a widely used scale to measure psychological quality of life of general population. It consists of 22 items that assess psychological well-being of respondents in six health-related quality of life domains, anxiety, depressed mood, positive well-being, self-control, general health, and vitality. We assess the psychometric properties of each of these uh, scales, the overall measure as well as each of the sub-scales, and use them in our analyses. In addition, we also uh, looked at qualitative data, specifically from Ethiopia, to get a more nuanced understanding of some of the mechanisms that might link child marriage to psychological distress. So uh, we ran a series of uh, regressions to estimate the association of child marriage with overall psychological well-being measures, as well as with each of the 
each of the subscales after adjusting for a variety of factors and found that uh, even after adjusting for these factors, there was a negative association of child marriage on the overall measure of psychological well-being as well as many of the subdomains. And this was uh, true for women who had it very early. So as you can look at the table from Nisha, it's right in front of you. Uh, so women who were married at age 15 or younger were more likely to have a lower psychological well-being score as compared to older women. And this was also true for many of the subscale measures. Uh, in Ethiopia, we see a similar pattern, but the effects are restricted to women who are married at age 12 or lower. And this again is true for the full measure as well as many of the subscale measures. Uh, but at age 13 and 14, we see some of the effects in some of the subscales, but not really in the overall measure. So going into the qualitative data. Uh, the qualitative data gave us a little more uh, insight into the ways in which child marriage uh, might impact the health of child rights in Ethiopia. There are two things that keep, keep, kept coming up in the thematic analysis uh, that we did was firstly the lack of choice, both in terms of the timing of marriage as well as in terms of child choice of partner. The other thing that the women brought up was the the burden on taking on adult responsibilities at very young ages. Specifically, they spoke about the challenges to satisfy partner's sexual demands, as well as uh, some of the reproductive and child rearing responsibilities that are placed on them early on uh, in the marriage. Uh, just uh, in the words of an Ethiopian woman uh, who was responding to a question by the interviewer about uh, whether she felt depressed uh, because of her early age of marriage, she says, yes. How do you think it feels to be forced into a marriage and a life with someone you didn't choose for you. Another woman uh, says, it used to be so painful for me when we, when we had the divorce. But I couldn't tell that to anyone. And then I refused. He used to beat me, splash water on me, put a rock on me, and he waited till I got tired and took me afterwards. I wished I was dead. So I'm going to stop here and hopefully have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. It's the qualitative part that really, I think, brings home the human cost of this of this practice. So thank you for your work and for, for shining a light on this. I'm going to move our footing out of the way slightly here. And then we'll move to the panel discussion. And Glenna, would you like to join us? So welcome Angelina, who's joining us. Um, Angelina Gonzalez, who is a forensic psychologist and also a Rise Up champion. Everyone familiar with Rise Up? Fantastic organization. If you're not, look into it. We've done a lot of work with them. Um, and their, their whole thing is helping equip girls to advocate for themselves on issues of reproductive rights, child marriage, you name it. Um, we have done advocacy in the UN with uh, a girl from Malawi who ended child marriage in her village and then took it to the parliament up the age of marriage to 18 and then she went to the UN and got our global women's issues ambassador excited about ending child marriage as part of US foreign assistance. So that's the kind of scope and caliber of advocates, just phenomenal women um, and girls that are associated with that organization and we're delighted to partner with them on this event. Angelina um, is, has expertise on this issue, particularly in Latin America, um, and so we're going to hear from her first. Um, just as a, a respondent who can kind of help us process I mean, your expertise is mental health. Um, you also have experience with early marriage in Guatemala, and I'm just curious how this latest presentation from Me Too about the truly severe mental health impacts how does that resonate with you? Is that something you see in Latin America as well? We don't hear about practice <laughs> much there. Yeah, thank you very much. And first for the invitation. Um, I want to thank uh, Rise Up um, organization for making the network so that I can be here today. Um, yeah, during my, my years as a, as a psychologist, um, as a Rise Up fellow, I have, I have uh, known many stories of women and uh, adolescent girls who have been forced into child marriage. Um, the, the women that I uh, had the opportunity to interview 
had many things in common. They usually told me that they had been child rights and they had been married for several years. They uh, usually were um, suffering um, physical, sexual, and psychological violence within the marriages. And they um, kept into these abusive relationships because they depended economically on their husbands and they, mm, they not only had to provide themselves, but they had to feed their children. And that's why they used to uh, um, stay in those marriages for many years. Uh, for the, as time goes by, they um, began, most of them began to experience different um, reactions, psychological reactions. Some of them um, uh, developed um, uh, of, like traumatic, traumatic symptoms. They develop, um, it's uh, called adjustment disorder. Um, in which they were not able to, to, to adapt to this life, uh, way of life. They also um, developed some depression, depression and uh, uh, personality disorders too. That was the different reactions. Uh, one of the important things is that the, the stage of life in which they were forced into child marriage was a very important uh, stage and they they, they had to leave behind their own goals, their own dreams, and to start a new life, taking responsibilities, as you would say, and uh, leaving behind social relationships and activities that were uh, of their own age. That was the, the most uh, symptoms or, or psychological reactions that I could see. Thank you. You know, I think it's interesting. One of the things that really came out for me, Ted, in your work was that we've really missed the mark on this when it comes to overlooking the role of the mother-in-law. And I don't know if that's because we associate things like violence with the man in the relationship, the intimate partner, the power holder in the relationship. If we overlook that because of a mother-in-law not actually being active in the process of reproduction or what, but it seems to me, you covered a little bit at the end of your presentation, where, what does this mean for the field in terms of we've overlooked mobility, but what about the mother-in-law? What, where do we go next on that? I think that's another area we really need to start looking more into, not just the mother-in-law, but relations throughout the family. Um, both the marital family and outside the context of reproductive coercion, the birth family. Uh, one of the most striking moments in a lot of those interviews were women who had married as children, recognized it as this harmful practice in their life, and then described the process of marrying their daughters. Not all of them, not even the majority of them, but a few of them. It was very striking to read these, how they had internalized these norms that they recognized as harmful to them, but still perpetuated them. So I think this is looking into those underlying gender norms that, is, that, are, that are driving child marriage that both women and men are buying into it and leading them to perform some form of violence, especially on younger women, by forcing them to marry in these contexts of child marriage. Uh, and one thing I don't think I had mentioned, which I should have, is that many of the limitations on mobility that we, discussed, that we found and discussed were uh, led by the mother and sisters-in-law, either the sisters of her husband or the wives of her husband's brothers. Um, particularly for women who were in the family for just a short period of time, um, these other women had an immense amount of influence on their lives and on limiting their mobility, and they were the ones who were largely restricting them. Um, so there really is this deeper level of, of research that we really need to understand what is reproducing these norms, and then how do we stop them from being reproduced? Perfect. Thank you. A similar question for you, Asla. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting that you, you kind of turned the way that we look about the relationship between child marriage and food insecurity on its head, which is to say, I think 
some of us recall as severe droughts in the Sahel region in 2012, and there was widely reported spikes in um, rates of marriage in countries like Niger, where you've done some of this work. Um, but now you're actually showing that it flows the other direction too, that child marriage also drives food insecurity. I'm wondering what that means in terms of structuring interventions. How do we take that finding and, and structure things differently? Well, I think uh, I'll sort of speak to it from uh, to the unique vantage point I had in, in doing this research, but also working on a few programs in, in the Western Africa region on, on uh, agriculture and nutrition linkages and empowering women, uh, especially those who focus on women and empowering women. Uh, uh, I think this really speaks to uh, understanding some of the underlying norms and discrimination and disadvantage women face, and that sort of then reinforce some of the gender inequalities that programs uh, attempt to address, such as uh, you know, control over resources or decision making about economic issues and so forth. So uh, I think that really, uh, I think this really reinforces the, the fact that uh, programs can, to the extent that it sort of really exists, to address more broadly and more, more integrated in their approach, but also uh, along the line of what is now becoming more and more of a uh, pattern, to really look at some of the gender transformational aspects of, of uh, approaching these issues instead of sort of coming up with sort of remedies at the sort of the and where we try to change uh, things, really looking at how can we really take, attain lasting change that can be, you know, empower women uh, through education, through productive uh, empowerment and control in their fertility decisions. Because, uh, you know, uh, if we cannot control those, I don't think we can really uh, fully address them with the chronic, as we mentioned, food security and economic insecurity issues that women and girls face. That and other people as well. It's all about norms. I think you're all, you're all saying that. Norms, that is, and I think it's something that I didn't necessarily mention, uh, I forgot to mention in my presentation, is that in, in these contexts, households are the economic unit. So there is the fact that, you know, there is a reason, there's an economic rationale for what it sometimes, you know, women or families think about marrying up their children as a, as a sort of a a risk mitigation issue or something that's economically or provides economic security and an option for, for their daughters. So there's a really circular relationship there that needs to be interjected and addressed for it, for the change to, to happen. And, uh, and uh, that was why uh, I talked about some of the pathways through which child marriage could impact food security. One was the fact that one thing I didn't mention is that you know, as, as you bring in more labor, more uh, you know, unpaid labor into your household, you can also expand your life options in the household. And in that respect, you could actually improve in some ways household security, which we didn't find. But uh, there, there is that, that fact that needs to be really understood and addressed in program, both on the child marriage side as well as on the economic environment and that security. Perfect. Thank you. Me too. Um, I'm re recalling sort of some of the genesis here of the work on mental health. And we have Suzanne Trenny in the audience with us who helped us um, really identify that a few years back when the World Health Organization data showed us that a leading cause of death, the leading cause of death for girls 15 and 19 around the world was suicide and self-harm. And much of that was driven by South Asia, which of course has very high rates of the practice. So that was sort of the genesis of, okay, we as ICRW commit to asking the questions that people aren't asking about mental health as related to child marriage, gender-based violence, FGM, all of these issues. Where, after this work that you've done, where you see such a clear connection, um, do you think the research agenda goes next? I'm going to give you the standard researchers response that we need more research. <laughs> no, Specifically okay. in this area, there is very little prevalence. We don't really have a lot of prevalence here on mental health, leave alone the connection that it has with many of these practices that we're talking about, specifically child marriage. <laughs> and you need both the prevalence data as well as you know better data to understand these relationships, plus also interventions like what can we really do to you know uh, to uh, help the in these situations, and I think Angelina would have better uh, answers to those questions. 
Uh, so I'm just hoping to be able to do more uh, cross sectional study of the one we did with the ICM. Uh, and also eventually be continuing uh, some more acute health research and really you know, isolate the effects of child marriage and see how it uh, would affect uh, the uh, how it's linked to the research. And I should say that each of these um, thematic issues and, and work that you're hearing about tonight have been. Um, have been submitted to academic journals and conferences and things, so there will be longer papers coming out in, in the future about this. Um, but we definitely are committed to taking that forward here at ICRW in terms of this being a major stream of work for us. Um, and Lynn, I think you two just asked you a question, which is, <laughs> what do we do about it? You're a practitioner. What, from an intervention perspective, what works? Yeah, uh, of course, research is important and necessary. But uh, in my experience, uh, in my experience as an activist and um, as a rights of rights of um, let girls lead fellowship, I I have known, I have seen in my experience that uh, advocacy sections also complete this research work that is great. But advocacy is a very important uh, part. Of the, of the solution. I think that working um, directly to policies and laws to protect girls and to um, give them access to justice uh, is something very important. And I would like to note that I did not pay Antonia <laughs> to say that advocacy is the answer to ending child but I'm delighted to hear it. Hopefully that's job security for me. Um, <laughs> So, Ted, coming back to you, um, you know, you started to get into a little bit of the differences um, between the districts uh, in terms of a, a couple of factors that were studied, and it seemed like you were starting to maybe draw some conclusions about to what we might attribute different manifestations of reproductive course, and given the context in these two very different areas. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that and, and what you think is going on? First, I want, to, I want to hesitate to draw any strong conclusions sure. from the qualitative data. Sure. I, I see suggestions for where f further research is needed. Um, but a few things that were notable. The girls who were married in Radahat, which was the district with um, more reproductive coercion that we recognized, um, tended to get married a little younger than the girls in Beitati. Um, they tended to, or they were less likely to have been in school. Um, and if they had attended school, they were more likely to have dropped out in primary school um, after first or second grade, usually. Uh, whereas the girls in Beitati, the majority of them had reached at least middle school, um, eight before they dropped out of school. Um, in both districts, um, marriage was related to dropping out of school, but of course it happened so much earlier uh, in one and then the other. Uh, one striking thing, coming back to the theme of mobility, see, it fascinates me. Um, is the women in the Tati described becoming more mobile after they had married. They gained more access to different institutions. They were able to go around to more places in their villages. Even the women who said that they felt more restricted in their mobility would often talk about saying people in their family would tell them they couldn't go somewhere and then they would go go somewhere. Um, and so you see this sort of difference in how the practice of women's movement is policed between the two districts, and I wonder what the effect of education would we know strengthens um, decision-making ability, what role that has in, its limitation, in these limitations of mobility, and what how these underlying norms about women's mobility are affecting education. Whether, as girls are getting older, they're not allowed to go to school in um, rather had because they are becoming of reproductive age, and they're felt that they need to be more controlled. Um, so those are areas that I think deserve further research. I'm also interested in seeing if there is a relationship between dowry yeah. and these practices. There's no, the women themselves did not talk as much about the dowry practices. That was something that our uh, Nepalese partner uh, had wanted to, us to talk about and was present and it could be an underlying factor in terms of the motivations of the earlier marriage. I think as um, Hasa described, the, the use of dowry as a way of getting security for the male family is something that's very important, and I'd be interested in looking more into that. Uh, so no, no firm connections, but a lot of 
potential audience. Because you did, I think the brief says that there was dowry was a big thing in one district yes. and less so in the other. Was that the same district where you saw more limitations on mobility and higher manifestations of coercion? Yes, it is. Well, thank you, panel, for uh, tolerating my uh, my series of questions. It's now time to hear from the experts in the room on your comments and questions. This is our, our goal and intention of this series is to hear also from you about your work. We have with us, of course, Suzanne, who is the godmother of this, uh, of this work. Uh, we have Jeff, who is a demographer, and uh, excuse me, Dr. Suzanne Petrani. Um, Dr. Jeff Edmunds, who is a demographer and the lead researcher in a great deal of this work. And we have Jennifer Parsons, who was our, our, our in early days worked with us on the economic, or on the, um, economic impacts conceptual model and um, helped get us started. And actually, I should just note, Jen, Chima looked at the model yesterday and he was like, this is really good. <laughs> It's nice to see that. So, so you've got, um, and then all of the rest of you who and Natalie are doing amazing work in child marriage, as you know, and as a group of new friends. Um, please do share your name and affiliation and your comment or question. Speak to the heavens, because that's where the microphones are when you have our friends online. And then friends online, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and either, um, I believe that there's a message box where you can type in questions and our friend Joe will relay those on your behalf. Yes, please, welcome. Uh, good evening, I'm a new friend. I've not been here before and it's very, my pleasure to be here. I'm Lala Kiyashvili. I work as a gender equality team at Save the Children currently. Uh, before I was, I'm, I come from the country of Georgia, so before I used to do a lot of work in Georgia, and I was one of the first researchers who started to research women's property rights in Georgia, and it's the same, the situation is just maybe the field, and it's fascinating how these issues are related to, and how when there is a problem, it has all the different angles that are very much similar. And also, just, just one comment, and I have questions to tell, if you don't mind. Um, it's also was fascinating to see how in Georgia also when it comes to property, women will transform from being a bride and wanting to have access to property to when she becomes a mother, especially mother of the boy, because then she becomes protective of the right of her son to have property. But when she's bride, of course, she wants to have more access to the property. So it was fascinating to see this transition of uh, that comes with age and motherhood. My question was regarding dowry. And if you know the women who have dowry and who came with the dowry, do they have access to this, like from the next day of the marriage, like if it comes in cash or if it comes in money, do they have any access of, at all to these resources? And the second question uh, is about um, mobility. Uh, another study that we conducted in at SAVE also we found that mobility was limited based on the purpose of the visit. So if she was going to the market to buy goods for the families, then she was allowed to go. But if she was going to benefit herself personally somehow, then she was restricted to do so. Do you find any similarities there as well? And also culturally, how the, how interviewer interviewees explain this change in mobile? So now she's more more respected that she has four straight children and that's why she can go, or what's the change in the woman culturally that allowed her to go out? I know it's a lot of questions, I'm sorry about that. It's very well equipped to answer that. Good um, Regarding dowry, uh, as I mentioned, the women did themselves did not talk as much about the practice of dowry. They would mention sort of what their dowry was, but it did not seem that they had any kind of access to it based on what they were um, discussing. I don't know about the, the, the practice more broadly in the region. Um, regarding mobility, I think in Daytari, which was that region in the hills where we saw less reproductive coercion, I think what you found largely reflects what the women's experience was. They were able to go to market and maybe not necessarily go to things for themselves, but even going to market was something that was new for them. Um, in Rabahat, on the other hand, uh, that was not the case. Women would mention specifically that it would be the older sisters-in-law, the um, particularly the other, her brother-in-law's wives, um, and the mother and the mothers-in-law would be the ones who would go do the shopping earlier on when she was living there, it really seemed as if they didn't leave the house. They would all say constantly that it was like a prison, that they couldn't leave. Um, 
And as they gain, as they had more children, in some cases, I think it's because families started to take in younger wives when they were younger brothers. So as uh, women were longer in a household, they became more of those older sister-in-laws. Um, and I think it is also a matter of uh, prestige and having more children, particularly sons. Uh, the one woman in the district who did not thrive any sort of reproductive coercion had two sons very early on, and her uh, younger brother-in-law married pretty shortly after she was married. Again, this is nothing definitive we can say from this research, but suggestions for this school. That's great. Makes sense. Asla uh, is an expert here on land and property rights and has done a lot of work on that as well. I don't know if you have any comment on the connection between land and property rights and the issue. Uh, well, Actually, this is one of the areas we explored in Niger, uh, and I came across the secondary data we used uh, with multiple across different countries, and uh, the, the results were mixed. Sometimes there is a relationship, sometimes you see a positive, there is no relationship, sometimes you see a positive relationship, which sort of suggests that, uh, sort of that one of the potential pathways of the relation, you know, the link between child marriage and food security, women who married into Know, into a family were given a land, piece of land to manage. And that's sort of because that was sort of their task to then, you know, grow crops and contribute to the household. So that was, for example, what we found in Asia. But the, the, the context really defined the relationships and the outcomes and potential to underlying factors that may have, have been caused one negative impacts. And again, one of the biggest questions with uh, this research is defining rights and ownership in the United States and very important to say that what we found was a definitive relationship, but it was statistically significant. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like a true researcher. <laughs> Me too, or Angelina, do you have any comment on either of those questions? Or shall we walk? I mean, I can just comment being a South Asian woman, not really <laughs> from a research perspective, and I think that mobility is from now that I do a lot of work in Africa, I find mobility in a way that kind of very different with these two contexts. Mm -hmm. That's really something that struck me as a South Asian woman traveling to Malawi for the first time and seeing that women actually were out about working. They didn't seem, they were, they were, they were uh, you know, they had other gender norms that sort of uh, diminished the agency and choice, but it wasn't really mobility. So that's something what a lot of the find people we see are in Nepal and projecting out it might be similar to, to the rest of South Asia. Uh, so this might not be the case uh, in the African context. But again, mm -hmm. this is just my own thoughts and personal journey as I've worked across the continents and nations. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank just wanted to cross a couple of you know findings that you were sharing. So looking at mobility, um, looking at gatekeepers, the roles of mother-in-law, and you extend that to others within the family. We understand, you know, if you're going to the market, that's something that is condoned and, and that's fine. What about around um, pregnancy, antenatal care? Was that coming up in your qualitative data and what were you finding? So, generally, uh, the women did not have as much access to antenatal care. And again, uh, there's a striking difference between uh, Radahat and Natadi. And uh, as far as striking this difference, this is going beyond the research we've been talking about today, but between the, the Nepal qualitative study and the Ethiopia qualitative study, um, the, um, the level of care in Radahat was very limited, um, as it was in Ethiopia, generally, um, women would des describe a lot of illnesses and injuries and high morbidity and mortality from, uh, obviously not the women causing themselves uh, mortality, but people they knew dying from childbirth because they had limited access to care. In Beitari, that seemed to be less an experience that was discussed. It was still discussed, but it seemed that, that the women had better access to um, antenatal care. They also had better access, it seemed, in general, to um, to other forms of sexual and reproductive health services. They just seem to have more access to contraception than either of the other studies that, um, that the transfers were from. And were there differences between rural and urban in the early the pre-rural districts? So they're both fairly rural districts, and in fact, the decision to look at them by, at a district level rather than a um, 
urban rural level, which is how we built at the data in Ethiopia, was from our um, local research partner, Mahit Curry, who um, we thought that that was the more um, salient difference to look at in Nepal. And just to plug in that we actually did collect data quantitatively as well in terms of uh, uh, some internal healthcare access and use and you know, associated costs. Uh, uh, so we are, is it, you know, further research could explore whether or not there is any differences between uh, use of these services among women and early or not, the type of services they saw, and some of the challenges they might have experienced. Yeah, we haven't yet. Uh, is it largely the system we have touched on these issues? But of all the sectors that we looked at in the costing work, fertility was the number one cost. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so mm -hmm. clearly, Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions and then invite uh, members of the panel to respond to whatever they like because we've got we're heating up now and I haven't gotten to our friends online. Dr. Kurt? Um, yeah, the I guess I'll take godmother over grandmother. <laughs> um, so thank you. Congratulations on taking the, the work, the next steps here. Um, so for me, one, one interesting thing that came out of this discussion is something that we always try to convey to people who are trying to design programs or implement advocacy efforts to end child marriage, which is context really matters. So you know, even talking about reproductive coercion in Nepal, it's not the same across Nepal. It's different in these two districts and it's different from Nepal to different parts of South Asia to different parts of Africa. Um, so just uh, to me, that was a theme that, that has come out from the um, discussions today and one that I, I would encourage us to continue to think about. It's You really have to understand rural versus urban in which country, in which settings and what's happening. Um, but I wanted to ask, so one of the, the reasons that ICRW initially undertook this research um, with the World Bank is that partners from around the world um, in countries where child marriage um, is prevalent had been asking for information on what are the, what are the impacts at the economic level, um, of course, but also what, what more can we understand about the impacts of child marriage? How has ICRW and, and partners um, taken the evidence from this project at that global level and at the national level and brought it to uh, your partners and country so that they can use it um, so I think this is mostly for, for you, Lyric, on the advocacy front, um, but also for Angelina, how, how do you see your counterparts in Guatemala using evidence like this to advocate at the national level to end child marriage? Thank you for those questions, Suzanne. I'm excited that I get to answer, so we'll hold that one. I, let's see here. I saw a coming across. Yes, here. Okay, so hello, everyone. My name is Lita. I'm from Armenia. Um, I am now a women's rights defender in Armenia with around 10 years of experience there, and now I'm with um, Global Fund for Children. Thank you for all your presentations. My question is about sterilization and whether you look at like, sterilization as form of reproductive coercion and what is the influence of this practice because. From my own research and experience, um, which I was doing in Eastern Europe, so sterilization is a really wide, widely um, done practice among like Roma uh, population in a lot of Eastern European countries. Um, and there are some researches also like how it impacted on health, uh, health or like economic situation. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, a, a lot of questions. I, first of all, thank you so much. This is fascinating. And I also have a comment. Um, so I wanted to ask mainly about the quantitative research. Um, did What season did you do the research in? Because that, of course, makes a difference between security. That's one. Um, and then did it matter the age of the woman at the interview in addition to when she was married? Um, and also, I'm so fascinated by Did you interview people, who, women who had not been married at an early age? Mm -hmm. okay. And I think now I have a <laughs> <laughs> comment. Sorry. Okay. Please, this is from. Um, please tell us who you are. I'm Laurie Krieger from the Nile Group. And this is from 
my own research in that of Judy O'Bill. Um, Judy O'Bill does talk about grandmothers and works with grandmothers, which find, finds them to be very powerful. Now, in Bangladesh, when we were looking at um, male involvement in reproductive health, mothers in law turned out to be surprisingly enough to grandmothers, not very important. So it really depends, as you said, on context entirely. We expected them, that's what we interviewed them for. But I would be really careful talking about norms and attributing everything to norms. This is from my own research, having just with my friend and colleague, Mark Edberg, at GW, submitted a paper on norms um, to a journal. We found that there are many, many different interpretations, and it's not so easy. So that um, it's not so easy to attribute to norms. For example, um, it makes perfect sense to me that a woman would need to have two or three children in a culture that insists on on women not being mobile because she's a stranger and she hasn't bought internet now. In particular, she's young. So I think that, uh, and she's because she's had no choice whatsoever. Um, so I think that's something to bear in mind as well. But some of it is just almost. I mean, it's it's. Kinship is logistical, it's not just normative. Um, and that's thank you for that. That's fantastic. Okay, so we have I count four buckets of questions here. Um, one, Dr. Petroni to me mostly, which is how did we partner? Um, two, Lita, thank you for your question on sterilization, which I have not considered. Um, three series of questions for you on the food security work, and I'd like to, I'd like to invite your comment as a question for anyone on the panel to respond to in terms of what about norms. Um, so quickly, monitor, moderator's prerogative, how have we partnered to get this uh, work out there? Um, and I think this, speaking for myself at least, this has been a really exciting project in terms of really pushing us to um, make sure that we are as intentional about the partnerships, dissemination, and yes, advocacy um, as we are about the research, which truly is project to project in a world where some donors are afraid of advocacy. You know, sometimes they're not necessarily a, an advocacy agenda from a particular piece of research. This was really a, 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 a piece of work that from the very beginning, and thanks much to your, I think, uh, vision and support of that, um, did anticipate that we would, this would be something that would have some advocacy punch. Um, and that has been true. So we knew that we wanted to make the rounds and talk to donor governments, as well as our um, obligation and intention to come back and talk to um, host governments where we did the research. What did we find? What's it costing you? What can you do about it? Um, but we found, you know, for example, the, the, the kind of synthesis brief, the like top findings brief that's out there that's two pages and lots of graphics, was a direct request from the government of Canada, where folks said, look, my minister wants to talk about this, we're spending money on this, it seems like maybe we could spend more money on this. Um, but honestly, for speeches and things, I need something even shorter than that great global synthesis report that you put out. So could you just pull something together that would be the punchiest qualitative <laughs> stories, the diagrams, the like, don't make me work so hard to find the numbers. So that's one where it's like we have a, we have some flexibility in this project because we have donors and partners who really supported that work to say, all right, governments, here's what we found. Is this helpful to you? What do you need? Um, you, of course, presented this work at the first African Union Girl Summit and had similar experiences where people were just kind of following you everywhere and saying, can you come to my country and do this again? Um, and to a certain extent, our third phase of this project has been responding to those calls. The Girls Not Rides Global Meeting happened in May, um, which was 500 groups there. I mean, in, in, in enormous. Um, and and that was, we presented this work, the World Bank was there, we were there, and then the whole final phase of that presentation was, if you have further resources that you need adapted from this study, let us know, and people are following us up with us, and we're doing some technical assistance in that regard. We've partnered directly with Girls Not Brides members in various countries where we did work to be able to bring in the country level analysis that we did, and help them pull those numbers into accessible policy briefs, do translation, all of that. 
stuff. So that's, I think, a really essential part of, of the impact story um, from this work and one that we're grateful particularly to the Gates Foundation for being able to do. Um, comment on serialization? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Angelina wanted to say something. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, Angelina. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we're asking about the Guatemala conflict. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, um, civil society organizations have done a great job. Last year, uh, we had the achievement of uh, the, the, the law against uh, the law that prohibits child marriage is um, now a reality. However, informal unions are still occurring, but at least we we, we had important achievement. And now uh, it, it's still in discussion another law to protect girls that have suffered sexual violence, um, sexual exploitation, and uh, human trafficking. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I think it's important that you you flag two things I think that are definitional for us. One, the difference between um, formal and informal unions, which of course we're counting both in child marriage uh, numbers, but the, the, that's a distinction that's very important. Um, and also earlier, you mentioned the difference between forced and child marriage, which is to say, of course, child marriage is either party under the age of 18. Forced marriage can happen at any age, um, but the importance of looking at all of those. So thank you for that. Sterilization. Sterilization. Um, in general, people in this study did not talk about sterilization. For the most part, these were women who wanted to have fewer children than they were being forced to have. So it was, um, if there were attempts to reduce amounts of childbearing, it was generally on the woman's side. So she would clandestinely use contraceptives. Um, a few women would talk about uh, self-induced abortions. Um, and so in general, it was not that women were not able to have children when they wanted to have them. It was that the women in this study were being forced to have children when they didn't. That being said, I'd be very interested to learn about other marginalized populations, particularly those in Nepal and other contexts such as the Roma in Eastern Europe, to see what's happening in terms of that form of coercion. I was just curious about what exact, I mean, the sterilization was, was it imposed by the state or from the department? Mm -hmm. Some of the say it's the family, so oh, whenever really? they have children and then they don't use contraception mm -hmm. part, so instead of contraception, they have to undergo sterilization in order not to have more children. But is that something because that's the only service that is accessible to them, or is it because uh, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah, method? Yeah, according to the researchers, it's more like cultural or this population. Yeah, and this is again like reproductive coercion because women have to do that against their laws. I mean, India has a history of sterilization, but it's pushed from the state, and it's become normative because you know almost every woman had two children and then got sterilized, so that's become almost normative, but it was started by the state to sort of kind of control the population. So, so the United States has a history of sterilization. <laughs> so, 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 so um, interesting. Thank just you. Just to add that, yeah. yes, it's absolutely cultural. It's just an easy way out. Like, oh, OK, you have two children, we should complete it out. So yeah, like, and then nobody, nobody has to worry about. Um, because women yeah. in these cultures are very seen as reproductive. Um, subjects, um, sometimes unfortunately even objects. So whenever the mission is completed, they don't have any other substantive uh, functions to do, so they can have sterilization. Thank you for the question. I think more research required. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> the night. I hope someone's good at that. Um, <laughs> A series of questions for you. Season of the research and its impact on food security. Um, we talked, I think, actually all of you, I think, talked about the significance of the age of marriage and the younger, the more severe sex issue. Um, but did age and interview matter? Did you look at that? I can't read my handwriting on that. <laughs> okay. Um, but let me just say that I screwed up the country. It was in Pakistan, not Bangladesh, and Bangladesh. We'll never forget me. We're doing that where we the mothers in law just didn't seem to have any input. Um, okay, the third one is wait a minute. While you're looking, why don't you take a why don't you take a stab at the season and age? 
Sure. So I think one question was yes, we did speak with both women who were married early and who weren't married early. That's how we can sort of draw some of these statistically significant differences across the two, two populations. And they were either currently married or married in the past. So we had some currently you now married women who had married early as well. And the, the data collection in Niger happened in the spring, which is their sort of, I think, their dry season which may have an impact, as you said, to the food security or dietary diversity. The way we tried to control for some of that was to look at a community level, the household food production, so how many different types of crops the community was growing uh, in the last 12 months, or I think the last 12 months. So sort of, sort of, given that the you know, economies are very localized, so the availability and the climatic variability was you know, control for in that way. And then as for the age of the woman, there was a negative association and depending on, so the older the woman was, the, the less dietary diversity we detected in the household, but the association was not significant. Uh, but to your point, I mean, some of the other sort of discussions have emerged. And because, again, I think linking back to your point as well, that not everything is around, nor then can't be defined, and I think I absolutely agree with you, and there's definitely, as I said, uh, also economic and other factors that define or that sort of uh, shape uh, families' uh, decision making around marriage, family formation. I remember reading a very interesting uh, study from Paxson, Cynthia Paxson, I guess, from the World Bank, who studied marriage patterns in India and how families tend to marry their children not only early but to sort of out of the faraway communities because if John hit here, they don't hit there, so they would always rely, they could rely on extended family to support in high time. So there's a lot more than just norms that really define these. And to that extent we also looked at polygamy, polygamous marriages and whether that had an impact and has a positive impact on household food security, supporting the fact that you know the adult population and the ability to households to produce and diversify their livelihoods obviously had a positive impact on food security. So I think that the economics of marriage and what sort of really uh, feeds into these decisions, including in child marriage, is a very fascinating study. That the paper that we are actually trying to put out is looking at it more holistically, including through the lens of child marriage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else on the panel want to speak to this uh, final piece on norms? Otherwise, we can go to the other side of the room. Yeah. Okay. Questions on this side of the room? We'll go one, two, and then we've got some online. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Millie. Uh, I am a communications and advocacy officer at Together Not Girls. We work in over 20 countries um, trying to collect data on violence, sexual violence against children. Um, and my question has to do with the link between the economic impacts of child marriage as well as maternal mortality. Um, before I worked at Together for Girls, I did a little uh, bit of work in the sexual and reproductive health and rights um, space. and we really led with uh, maternal mortality as kind of the, the reason policymakers should kind of adopt more of an SRHR focused um, policy regime. So I'm wondering just um, uh, within the research as well as within advocacy efforts, is there a place and space to connect and link um, the economic impacts of child marriage with maternal mortality? Um, and just your all thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Dr. Randy. Well, first, congratulations on making it through three long years of working on this really interesting, I think, uh, set of, of findings as a whole, and, and today that you presented. I have a, a comment and a question. The first comment is really about thinking the question of interventions, which came up in, in the discussion. And I think very obviously these results demonstrate again um, that child marriage is a very bad thing for most girls who are married um, at very young ages, um, which motivates us to uh, focus on prevention of child marriage. But I think really it, it, it also behooves us to think about mitigating the effects of child marriage because we know it continues to exist. It will continue for and very large numbers for a considerable period of time. And so I think when we think about interventions, we need to be looking at these results 
and thinking what do they tell us in, in terms of mitigation as well. So I look at the, the mental health uh, findings and I wonder if some of what we need to be looking at are things like relationship quality or, or spousal communication, which I know need to on the paper about. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think the problem is we often we ignore the the girls once they're married. We're very interested in preventing them from being married, and then when they do become married, they disappear until they show up again in uh, childbirth statistics or in terms of contraceptive use and so on. But but those are the those are the people who are suffering the most. They're the immediate following following marriage, and and we I think from an intervention perspective should be paying more attention to them than, than we are. And then my question, um, which is, uh, I think, something that I am thinking about a lot too, is our results, and I think the economic impact component of it, tend to show more of a picture of very early marriage as having more of a significant impact. And I think there could be a number of reasons for that. But I wonder what you think, as a group, what does that mean for, for interventions and how we should be thinking about um, child marriage and its effects in general. Thank you so much. Yeah. Joe, do we have folks online who want to ask a question? Yeah, are you, all, of, all of you have answered a number of them, but I'll try to, uh, including one by Meg Green, so that's yeah. turned that question into more of a shout out <laughs> for several of <laughs> them in the room, uh, where she basically said she she's expressed his appreciation for the roles of Jeff, Suzanne, Jennifer Parsons, Osla, and uh, from the beginning of this work um, and it's great to hear how others are taking the work forward as well her question was about how it's being taken forward so we'll ask more of that but the other question i wanted to uh, read out um have any of the panelists done any research on the incidence of child marriage in matrilineal societies especially in malawi if yes are there differences in the factors that contribute to child marriages in such societies when compared to patrilineal societies yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And we always love love. So thanks to Red to Meg for that. Um, okay, so we'll swing back to the panel then. We've got the first question on connections in research or advocacy to maternal mortality. Um, the second on just thinking about not only prevention but also mitigation. What are we thinking about in terms of very early uh, marriages and then what are we doing about married girls altogether? Um, and then I think what I'd like to do is structure uh, Meg's question about how we're taking this forward as an introduction to our closing speaker. So we'll take that one last. Um, and then finally, the matrilineal question is Malawi or otherwise probably helpful. Um, shall we go down the line? Angelina, would you like to offer some thoughts and we'll come one by one? Do any, we'll do do anything that speaks to you. <laughs> Or what's the question we should have asked? Yeah, I think I could um, add some information about the normal Yes, please. And uh, it, is, it is in my experience uh, working with girls and adolescents, I have seen that the, the, the biological, biological characteristics of the girls, of course, um, they are not psychological or biological prepared. For, for child marriage. So they are, um, and as you were saying, they are not like uh, taking making decisions about their own bodies. Uh, they are expected to get pregnant after marriage. And uh, this is the thing, they just start to have a lot of children and without their own opinion or without the, the own, or having control of their own bodies. So. Of course, this, um, um, they are very vulnerable. I mean, of course, if they get pregnant in a very early stage of their life, they, they, they can die. They can, they can. And the health providers uh, sometimes are very far away from their homes, and they don't, they don't get the, the, the medical attention that they need uh, in the time that it's time of it. Some of the things that I can tell you in Guatemala. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to try and answer some of Jeff's questions. And I think they're just tough questions, things that we are sort of grappling with and sort of figuring out. I don't really have the answer inside. I should have more discussions with you on it. 
But in terms of just like the gradient of this, that is this one, that can be found that very early girls, uh, very early marriage was not that really had any impact. What does that mean? And what is uh, what is happening to the adults in terms of the developmental stage? And how that links to some of these outcomes is something we need to study more. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of advocacy for, you know, uh, what the lyric does, I mean, it's a lyric answer. But I think it is definitely interesting that that has come out not only in our work, but also in the bank's work. And it's something that we need to sort of understand like what is so special about this developmental space that particularly makes them vulnerable to these uh, different outcomes. And in terms of interventions, couples is the way to go. <laughs> I think that's my pet, uh, my favorite uh, uh, sort of project. And it's not just about child marriage, but it's just in general about young marriages and being able to. Uh, provide a lot of these uh, couples with the support and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the support that they need to sort of have a relationship, whatever that means. And I am actually part of an RCT that's happening right now in Nigeria, where we're sort of looking at uh, some of the ways that we could uh, enhance uh, the relationship and uh, the effects that it would have on things that we could have like coercion, IPV, as well as contraceptive use. So hopefully, when I have results, I'll be able to give some more ideas about. What could the work in this Touch briefly on the question of interventions. Um, one thing that several of the women talked about in Nepal was how affected they were by the loss of their education. But at the same time, there were a, very, a small group of women, mainly in Betari, in that region in the hills, where there was less reproductive, co where we found less reproductive coercion who were able to continue school after for a little while after their marriages. It varied person by person. <clears throat> and seeing the ability for women who have already been married to then have access to education and to then maybe not have that extra factor that we're finding throughout the research as a major effect of child marriage and the loss of education is related to many of these economic losses. I think it would be a very interesting intervention point. Look at those very recently married girls who might still be able to um, go back to school. Speak briefly to the question on Malawi. We are currently working on an assessment or an evaluation of a project in Malawi. It's mainly looking at the response to child marriage rather than the drivers there, so I can't speak as much to that matrilineal society. But interesting with the question based on norms, for that project, um, our lead, Laura Hinson and Mark Steinhaus, um, used CARES uh, SNAP tool, and I'm going to forget what that said, social norm analysis plot. Um, the, uh, and what they found in, that, in the baseline was that in these communities, people were not viewing child marriage as a norm. There was this fact that people were marrying their daughters young. Daughters were in general getting married before the age of 18, um, but they but the people who were answering the question did not feel that they were expected to marry their daughters or the girls over whom they had decisions before age 18. And they did not um, feel that they would be sanctioned. And yet the, the practice remained despite that. So not as much about the matrilineal society necessarily, but something that was of interest. Thank you. And I'll probably speak to the same thing and just second what Ted just mentioned in terms of the importance of education. And again, I think one of the refinements that sort of emerged from our empirical research, which our conceptual framework was how much of the impact we saw, the cost we saw were through the education, that that was the sort of the major thing. And you know, when you have some of the marginal effects with like an additional year of delaying marriage or an additional year of schooling and what it does to women's fertility and how many children they have, and also the likelihood of working for pay, and all these factors really point to why some of the impacts are much more pronounced at an early age, and or culminate through the sort of vulnerable years, and or where the key sort of, I think, and entry points may be in both preventing and in the later years mitigating for some of the impacts. So I would definitely also bring out it. And education is also, I think, in many ways, a, a sort of entry point for affecting change at scale. So this is in relation, you know, compared to some of these more sort of focused, intense norm change interventions, there seems to be more of a, a sort of a, a sort of a debate over what's 
more fixed entry points and how do we make effects change at scale and, and, and so forth. Uh, and then on the maternal health uh, thing, uh, I think that we have, especially the data we used from secondary data analysis with DHS data, uh, we saw in it across different countries some impact, but it was very different and it really speaks to more the weakness of the data than whether or not that association exists because conceptually the pathways from access to health services to sort of the psychological and biological impact on having an early child Thank you. Um, I'd like to use the, the question about how we're taking the work forward um, to introduce our closing speaker. Thanks, first of all, though, to our panelists who have um, shared such thought-provoking work, um, which we have only gotten a taste of this evening, which we will read more about in various papers, and hear more about in various um, conferences to come. Um, but thank you for spending a little bit of time and for sharing uh, some, some early insights in the policy briefs that we have at the back. Thank you, Angelina, for joining us and talking about your great work. It's so wonderful to have you and to have um, your expertise and your experience both in mental health and also in the Latin America region, which is, to, to my view, a place that we need to hear a lot more about moving forward. Um, so welcome and thank you. Um, to the question about how are we taking this moving forward, we've talked a little bit on the advocacy side about what's next. Um, I'll say, certainly looking ahead, we have, we're in September now, so we're going to all be going to the UN um, at the end of the month where we have General Assembly Week. Um, there will be a resolution on child marriage, um, typically co-sponsored by Canada, as well as Zambia. Um, Jeff, to your point about what about married girls, um, you know, I think it's going to be a difficult year at the General Assembly, but one of the areas that we think we can make some progress is on the question of married girls. Um, so that's actually a specific focus of the resolution, and I think something that is an advocacy opportunity, even in a kind of crazy political sphere at the moment. Um, so thank you for that. And also, I should say that um, the mandate of Girls Not Brides USA, uh, which we do, as I mentioned, co-chair with CARE and the International Women's Health Coalition, is to push the US government and child marriage both through prevention as well as to meet the needs of married girls. Um, and that second clause falls off the pitch list, you know, uh, much of the time. But thank you for reminding us of its importance. Um, so that's what's next for us on the advocacy side. You've heard a little bit more about what's next on the research side from these guys. But really, the person who's, I think, best uh, placed to answer that question in terms of where do we go from here as ICRW is the leader of this portfolio, Dr. Chima Uzukara, who is going to close us out, give us some insights and your vision for this portfolio of work moving forward, which you lead. So um, the floor is yours, Chima. I've just noticed we walked off with the podium, so, uh, <laughs> so I will get it for you. Um, I'll well, leave. I'd love to say something. Uh, I'm the African. I would like to say something. Very, very important. Uh, my grandmother. My paternal grandmother, uh, Maria Bichoff, around night. She, 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 she told us that the first time she landed in her first husband's house, she was around night. She didn't actually know what she was going to do. The marriage broke down the following day. But she woke up and a piece of clothes that her father gave her uh, was now in the hands of man. The man was using it. So she didn't understand that. She went around the Husband kicked the piece of glue and ran back to her own fire. <laughs> and when she got there, she explained that uh, this piece of cloth that you gave me, I found out that uh, my husband had taken it. And uh, she said she wasn't going back there. The father supported her to stay back, the mother supported her to stay back. And uh, she told us that by the time she married my grandfather, uh, she had been to about three other marriages and never mm. lasted. And actually, it was in the house of my grandfather that she first saw her children. Mm. So 
So that gives you a sense of what, of course, this happened many years ago. But it gives you a view to some of the challenges that people uh, uh, face in the context of the culture of China. Well, I don't really think I have so much to say because I think the panelists are very clear. I don't want to dilute the knowledge and things that we have passed in this room uh, uh, today. Uh, but if I were to summarize what I've had today, uh, I think um, we are we, we, we are all in agreement that uh, child marriage is, is a big issue um, uh, from any source of persisting. I mean, there, there, have been, there, have been, there have been lots of efforts, interventions, programs to address this in the past, but uh, uh, where there is progress, this problem uh, persists. Not just in the global south, we also find facilities on this in the past countries of the world. Um, the other important thing that emerged from this discussion today is that it's a problem that has vast implications. Uh, implications are not just social, they've got economic implications, it's got uh, health implications, uh, physical implications, uh, psychological implications, and I doubt that it's possible to be able to wrap. Uh, the cost of child marriage in one study because it's just too broad to be able to do that. So um, the cost also quite uh, uh, the cost also quite quite uh, 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 large. Like I said, the good economy in terms of the money, the cost of the psychological one sometimes is difficult to measure the impact of the cost, this psychological impact of of, of, of of some of these uh, issues. Um, I, I also think that one of the big issues with costs, studies that try to cost social problems is that they miss the cost of mortality. You know, it's quite difficult to measure the cost of mortality. Now, of course, you're going to measure costs on people or around people who are alive. But in many instances, you have lots of women who die as a result of early childbearing, as a result of poverty in the house, a lot of lack of, despite the people to cost uh, mortality. And these implications for the next generation of children, you know, and so on and so forth. And these are very important issues. Uh, and there's need for us to think about interventions that can actually eliminate this problem. Um, as part of the plan that's been going on here, um, we are very committed to taking this agenda forward. Uh, it's an area of research that we have selected as a key area and key thing for further interrogation and for further research uh, at ICSW. Uh, some of the questions we are asking will be focusing on the persistence of this problem. You know, what is it that continues to drive this issue in different contexts? Uh, in some contexts, you know, poverty might be responsible. In others, Comes my play role. But there are also places where we see this is being driven by conflict situations. So we need to be able to wrap our mind around these different issues driving these problems in different context for us to have solutions that are sustainable and we have an uh, impact. The next question, the next issue for us to, is to begin to understand what works. You know, what works in terms of not just ending child marriage. But also in terms of dealing with the challenges of people who we are married as child, as, as children. And I think you brought up that point about the need for us to think also of interventions that, in, that have a focus on women who are living their lives uh, married as young, married as children, but are living as still alive. We have little interventions addressing the needs of these women. These are this is also an area that we are thinking of uh, moving forward. And then the whole question of coping strategies among these women. This is also an area where there is very little research. And for us to be able to build intervention that will respond to the challenges that these women have, we need to understand how they're currently managing their lives and dealing with the issues that they currently face. Uh, and uh, uh, very finally, we're also thinking of broadening our understanding of the cost of child marriage. Uh, I wouldn't go into the details of that, but that is also an area where we think that there is need for more richness around the way we cost this for it to be able to deliver the, the, the right impact. 
I don't think it's my duty to say maybe for coming to do what <laughs> but just before you come to say that you come to do that job, thanks for coming. <laughs> I'll be calling on you as we continue this this on this journey and path, and we hope that we we'll find from you their partners and allies. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming. So thank you for coming. Thanks to those of you who joined us online as well. Um, we appreciate your time, your insights, your questions. Please don't hesitate to be in touch um, either now in the remaining minutes of the time that we have here with our uh, wonderful speakers. Um, should you have further questions or follow up, um, but also you know don't hesitate to reach out in the future. All of our contact information is on the website. Join us for future ICRW Insights. We do this every month. Um, it may not be as great as this one. <laughs> That's what we ever had. Um, but we really, we really are keen to use the space to convene, to hear from you, and to tell you the latest on what we're up to. So with that, thank you. And good night. Thank you.